Hello and welcome to this virtual presentation titled Rational Isogenies from Irrational Anomorphisms. Uh, I'm Lawrence and this is joint work with Walter and Frey from Leuven. So as you might have guessed, this is a talk about isogeny-based cryptography, um, but I still want to start off by giving a very high-level explanation of um, what our paper is about for people who don't know much about the underlying mathematics but still want to get the, the big picture of our work. Um, so the most uh, direct implications um, of our work uh, concern a scheme called Seaside, and that is basically just a cryptographic uh, one-way group action, uh, meaning it's an algorithm that takes uh, two inputs. The first input is an element of an abelian group, G, and the second input is an element of a certain set, X, and then the output is another element of X. And, uh, well, being a group action means that uh, this operation is compatible with the multiplication in G such that when you apply two group elements, uh, it's the same as applying the product of these group elements. Um, why is this interesting? Well, um, we can easily build a Diffie-Hellman style key exchange from this by essentially taking Diffie-Hellman and replacing the exponentiation that's happening in Diffie-Hellman by this binary operation. So then uh, the secret key space would be G and the public key space would be X. And, um, well, it's easy to figure out that this works. And uh, for well-chosen group actions, and we hope that Seaside is such a thing, uh, we can hope that this gives a post-quantum secure Diffie-Hellman non-interactive key exchange, which is why this is uh, kind of interesting. Uh, so one... Open problem that's sort of reasonably well known among isogeny people is that of hashing into the set X. So um, that basically means you would like some method, some algorithm, some formula um, that essentially spits out elements of the set X in such a way that it's uh, provable ideally or uh, maybe plausible that nobody can know which element of G took you to this new element of X that your algorithm just produced. Right, so uh, sticking with the discrete log analogy, that would mean um, you would like to just produce an element of your group um, where you can argue somehow that nobody knows the corresponding secret key with respect to some generator of your discrete log scheme. Uh, and for, for GLP, in fact, it, we easily can do this for all the groups we care about, right? So for finite fields, you can just write down a random number and it's good. Um, for elliptic curves, you have to do a tiny little bit more work, but basically you can very easily sample close to uniformly or uniformly from these groups. Unfortunately, um, for this uh, isogeny setting, this is much harder. If you just write down a random bit string, uh, it has an exponentially small chance of being a representative of an element of X. Um, so we have to do more work. Um, here is a complete survey of the known methods to produce elements of this set X, besides dumb things like random guessing. Um, the first one is you take some known element of X. There are a few of these. They are documented in the literature. You can easily figure some out. And then you pick a random element of your group that has enough entropy or something, and you just apply it to this well-known public element. And then you have a new element of X because that's what this group action did. Um, but the problem is that obviously this doesn't serve our purpose, right? Because, um, well, we know what the connecting element is because we chose it ourselves. So, you know, this is definitely not the thing we want. And uh, the other method is, and that is in fact actually the method how we even arrive at these few publicly known elements of X, um, is to reduce a certain well-chosen elliptic curve over a number field modulo your um, prime P. And then, you know, if this curve was chosen well enough, uh, it will in fact be an element of X. And uh, it's not immediately obvious how this new element is connected to the other known elements that we've obtained earlier or that are just publicly known. Um, or at least that was the case until we wrote our paper. And um, basically, this is one of our main conclusions. Um, if we know a little tiny bit of information about this curve that's reduced modulo p here, then we can easily write down what a certain group element is that connects this new curve that we just obtained to some other well-known curve that's existed forever. Um, at this point, I should also mention that this is uh, very much related to parallel independent work by Bonnet and Love. Um, and, well, they basically arrive at the same conclusion using quite different uh, 
point of view. All right, so after this very high level overview, uh, let me explain some more details that we'll need to describe our results. Um, so among elliptic curve people, it's relatively well known that uh, if you consider an imaginary quadratic order that occurs as the anamorphism ring of an ordinary elliptic curve, then the ideal class group of that ring acts on the set of all those curves that have this anamorphism ring. And this action is free and transitive, meaning that once you fix a base element, it is a bijection. Um, what's, I believe, much less well known is that, in fact, this also works for supersingular elliptic curves if you restrict to curves defined over fp instead of fp squared, and you also consider just the subring of endomorphisms that are defined over fp. So this, again, is an imaginary quadratic order, whereas the full endomorphism ring of a supersingular elliptic curve is non-commutative, and it's a maximal order in a quaternion algebra. So this is, in fact, the, the main contribution of C-side using this uh, action on a supersingular isogeny graph defined over fp for cryptography. So C side is just the CM action of an imaginary quadratic order containing Q adjoint squared minus P on the set of elliptic curves that are super singular necessarily, defined over FP, which have that order O as their FP anamorphism ring. Um, computationally, how do we compute this action? Well, the elements of the class group are represented by invertible ideals, and uh, so this ideal is a subset, subset of the anamorphism ring. And the action on a certain curve, E, is given by, uh, well, intersecting all the kernels of endomorphisms contained in this ideal and quotienting that out. And by general uh, elliptic curve isogeny theory, we know that every finite subgroup is the kernel of an isogeny. So this gives you an isogeny to a different curve, and that's the output of your group action. Um, you can prove that, in fact, this action is also free and transitive. Right. Um, so there's another problem here, namely that generally computing the action of an arbitrary ideal is quite hard. Uh, if you do it naively, it's exponential time. There's an algorithm that does it in sub-exponential time, but it's definitely not poly time. Um, so to make this action efficient, we in fact restrict to ideals of a very special form. Namely, there's some fixed choice of uh, small prime ideals called L1 through Ln. And um, then we just take some small product combination of these uh, prime ideals and use that as our secret keys. And then you have to somehow estimate the size of your key spaces and stuff to, to make this all uh, big enough to cover the entire uh, the entire public key space and, and so on. But this can be made work. And then evaluating the action of this is very efficient because, well, each individual L can be applied quite efficiently. And then uh, doing this a small number of times is still efficient. Um, one main advantage of C-side compared to using uh, the CM action on ordinary curves is that applying one of these prime ideals Li is particularly cheap. So the bottom line is that uh, C-side gives you non-interactive key exchange that we expect to be post-quantum secure and it's relatively fast at that. So it's really sort of like a replacement for Diffie-Hellman in many cases. A helpful and quite common way to visualize this group action is through its Schreier graph, which looks like the one shown on the slide here. And this graph is made by um, taking all the elliptic curves in your set X as the nodes. And then between two curves, you draw an edge for each ideal in your set of generators, L1 through Ln, that connects these two curves. Right? So um, the colors here represent the different generators, L1 through Ln, and then uh, from each curve, you have two outgoing uh, edges f for each color, and that represents the action of L and L inverse. So in a sense, you can really interpret this uh, secret key group operation as a random walk on this graph, which maybe gives some intuition why this is potentially secure. Okay, so on this slide, I'm showing all the notation used in this talk. Um, it's just here for reference, so feel free to pause the video if you want to have a look at it. Uh, I'm going to skip it now. Cool, so with the preliminaries out of the way, we can finally start thinking about the actual problem that we were trying to solve. Um, so suppose somebody just hands us a curve in the seaside graph, for instance, um, and we're told or guaranteed that this curve has an irrational anamorphism of some prime degree L. So irrational just means it's not defined over FP. And we're asking ourselves the question, where in the isogeny graph can this curve be? 
can we somehow just learn something about A based on this knowledge that uh, it has this anamorphism? Um, so looking at a picture, um, this circle represents, for example, one of these uh, isogeny cycles in the Schreier graph picture. And uh, yeah, so here the situation is that A connects E0 to E. And we're trying to figure out what A is given E0 and E and knowledge about this anamorphism of E. Um, so the first helpful fact to reason about this picture is to notice that it has, at least in some cases, and we're just going to consider these cases for now, uh, a certain symmetry. Namely, um, it was already pointed out in the initial Seaside paper that um, in the special case that P is 3 mod 4 and you use this very specific curve, um, y squared equals x cubed plus x, as your starting curve, then um, taking the quadratic twist of one of these curves in the graph basically means you're inverting the class group element that took you there from E0. So for short, twisting means inverting the class group element. That's a good rule of thumb to keep in mind. And uh, that alone doesn't tell you much yet. But the second more crucial observation is that if you additionally assume, and that's not always true, but let's assume for now, that um, this anamorphism anti-commutes with Frobenius, then you can actually make an FP rational isogeny from E to its quadratic twist from that anamorphism by just composing with the isomorphism from E to its quadratic twist. Right, so that, that isomorphism is also not defined over FP, but the composition of these two maps is defined over FP. And the reason is basically that uh, the isomorphism to the quadratic twist negates Frobenius. So if before composing with this isomorphism, uh, the anamorphism was anti-commutative with Frobenius, afterwards it will be it will commute with Frobenius, and that means it's uh, an FP rational isogeny. Um, so basically, knowing that this tau exists and assuming these extra conditions that I've just added on this slide, um, tells you that there must be an edge from E to its quadratic twist in the L isogeny graph, and that must come from the action of an ideal of norm L. So I've just added this to the picture. Um, and now if we look at this picture very carefully, we can see that the composition of A and A again, and then in the middle this bit is uh, just the, the green arrow uh, labeled L plus or minus one. Um, well, it's the entire circle, right? So we can just solve the equation arising from this picture, and it's a quadratic equation, and it tells you pretty much exactly what A squared is. So we just observed that just knowing that this curve has this kind of special anamorphism that satisfies all these conditions on the last slide, um, already allows you to learn a whole lot about the secret element A. In fact, it's defined up to the two torsion in the class group. Um, of course, there's still a computational question of being able to compute the square root, but let's get to that later. Um, for now, the question is, is this just a weird special case? Does this only happen for that very specific choice of parameters on the previous slide? And, uh, well, the answer is no. So basically, we're going to spend most of the rest of the talk uh, on removing all of these conditions that I added on the last slide. And just for brevity, we'll quickly introduce the word twisting endomorphism for an endomorphism that anti-commutes with Frobenius. All right, so on this slide, I've basically compiled our to-do list of questions uh, that arise from this very special example that we've seen. And um, so, of course, the, the very first question is, um, can we even compute A when we are given A squared? Can we compute square roots in the class group? And it's not that obvious how to do this. Um, the next question is, if, once we can compute a square root, is it clear that there's not too many square roots? Like, for all we know, there could be so many square roots that, you know, it basically doesn't tell us anything about A. Um, so we need to somehow bound the size of the two torsion of this, of this class group. Um, then the question is, when are endomorphisms twisting? Is this very common? Can we expect this to happen? Do they even exist? Um, another question is, well, we've seen that this example worked partially because this very special starting curve, E0, was right in the middle of, of this isogeny cycle. So it was basically on the axis of reflection of this twisting uh, symmetry. And uh, so can we somehow generalize this idea to starting curves that aren't their own twist? Uh, and finally, can we generalize all of this to primes that aren't 3 mod 4? The first problem on the list is how to compute square roots in the class group. And uh, the good news is that First of all, Gauss knew how to do this 222 years ago. Uh, and it turns out that his method from back then is actually polynomial time now, so that's pretty good. Um, if you happen to know the class number of this ring and it's odd, then of course there's an easier way, like in any group. But computing the class number takes sub-exponential time, so this is much less efficient in general. 
how many square roots are there? So it's known that you can only get elements of order 2 in the class group at primes dividing the discriminant of the number field. And in this case, the discriminant is either minus p or minus 4p, depending on the value of p modulo 4. So the only potentially bad prime divisors are p and 2. Let's have a look at what these give us. Um, for p dividing the discriminant, well, we just get the ideal generated by Frobenius, but that's a principal ideal, so it doesn't correspond to a non-trivial element of the class group. For 2 dividing the discriminant, we indeed get a non-principal uh, ideal dividing 2. Um, so this corresponds to an actual non-trivial element of the 2 torsion. And uh, the bottom line is that, well, the, the 2 torsion of the class group is either just the trivial group when p is 3 mod 4, or it's isomorphic to z mod 2 when p is 1 mod 4. And therefore, a square element of the class group has either 1 or 2 square roots, depending on what p mod 4 is. And with this, we finish discussing the first two points of our to-do list. Let's talk about twisting endomorphisms. So recall that our goal was to locate reduced CM curves in the isogeny graph. The question is, how common is it for an endomorphism that comes from reducing a CM curve to be a twisting endomorphism? Um, to answer this question, we got the following theorem that basically says, well, if the CM that this curve has is by an endomorphism uh, of prime degree L that's smaller than about p quarters, then the reduction is guaranteed to be a twisting endomorphism. So yes, in principle, there is a restriction, um, but for cryptographic purposes, p is so massive that you can't even write down these curves for a larger L. So I dare say, practically speaking, reduced CM endomorphisms are always twisting for the cases we care about. Uh, moreover, if they aren't, uh, it's typically easy to find a twisting endomorphism if you're given just any irrational endomorphism. This depends a bit on how these things are represented and some details, but as a rule of thumb, this is usually doable. So we've got ourselves another check mark on the to-do list. So if the starting curve is not as nice, meaning it's not exactly in the middle of this picture, right on the axis of reflection, then it has a non-trivial quadratic twist somewhere else in the graph. And this twist must be connected to the starting curve by some ideal class B, as shown in the picture. And then if we fill in the usual scenario that we're considering of an elliptic curve that has a twisting endomorphism of degree L, um, we get a similar picture as before, except that there's an extra twist of E in the picture and this, this ideal class B. But basically, there's no reason why we can't still solve for this missing part A. And if you write down the equation, it looks just like before, except with a little extra B stuck in there. So basically, this is no issue at all. Um, so yeah, of course we can deal with starting curves that aren't their own twist. The last question on the list is, what if p is 1 mod 4 instead of 3? And the good news is that we've basically already dealt with all the issues that arise in this case while going through the other items on the list. Namely, well, if p is 1 mod 4, then the class group order is even, so you get 2 instead of 1 square roots. And uh, there is no curve that sits right in the middle of this picture, so there's no curve that's its own quadratic twist. But everything else basically works the same. It's just that this element of order 2 gives you an additional symmetry in this picture, and you can actually sort of visualize it like this. Um, and if you stare at this picture for long enough, it becomes kind of clear why this picture is not enough to distinguish which side of this circle you're on. So that's why um, just Using equations based on this picture, you cannot distinguish how many copies of T there are in your secret ideal. Um, to figure out which square root is right, you can either just try both and see which one works, or there's actually a much, much nicer solution, which is in a recent ePrint paper, and that one breaks DDH, for the case P is 1 mod 4, for this group action, um, essentially by looking at this two torsion component and seeing if the Diffie-Hellman pairs are consistent with the uh, with the two torsion parts. Uh, and this can also be used to figure out which of these two choices is right in our scenario. So that's our last check mark on the to-do list, and we've essentially generalized this very special example from the beginning to a complete theory of what's going on here. So based on all this stuff that we've just discussed, um, we came up with the main theorem of our paper. Uh, it structurally looks like this. I'm not showing all the details, but you can read it up in our paper. Um, so basically, for this CM reduction scenario, where you take a CM curve and you reduce it modulo P to get a super single elliptic curve, we tell you exactly how many curves over FP there are that are reductions of these curves, um, which combinations of FP endomorphism ring and the reduced CM ring are possible. And finally, and that's 
perhaps the most important thing cryptographically speaking, where exactly in the isogeny graph all of these curves are. So we tell you exactly how to get there from the special starting curve. And it's important to point out that we formulate this theorem only for p equals 3 mod 4 because that's the interesting case for C side. Um, but similar results are most likely possible for p equals 1 mod 4. It's just that we didn't work it out exactly and didn't write it down. Okay, so just in case the previous discussion seemed a bit abstract and detached from reality, I'm going to show an example that shows just how explicit our methods are. So in the Seaside 512 parameter set, um, it's actually true that p equals 11 mod 12, which means that this curve written down here, y squared equals x cubed plus 1, is also super singular because p is 2 mod 3. Um, so where is it? And, well, we figure out exactly where in the graph it is and how to get there from the starting curve chosen in the Seaside 512 parameter set. And this basically shows that you cannot possibly hope to use that curve as a non-backdoored, publicly chosen random curve in the graph that nobody knows the secret key to. On this last slide, I want to talk about something that is actually a significant chunk of our paper, um, but obviously it was impossible to present everything in this talk. So I'll just give a short summary and I encourage you to have a look at the paper if you're interested. So in the Assotidini literature, there's a thing known as the KLPT algorithm, named after Coel, Lauter, Pitti, and Tinol. And what this algorithm does is, um, well, given a super singular elliptic curve defined over fp squared, and given its entire endomorphism ring, in some sufficiently explicit computationally useful representation, um, you can use this to find an isogeny from some specific fixed curve E0 to that curve E in polynomial time. Um, However, a priori, usually this isogeny is not defined over fp, and there's not really a reason for it to be. So this doesn't really break seaside, even if you reveal the entire endomorphism ring. So the question is, maybe we can actually reveal endomorphisms, except those that are twisting, because, of course, according to uh, the earlier contents of this talk, those break the scheme. Um, and our paper also addresses this question by basically... Um, giving an analog of the KLPT algorithm for curves defined over fp. So the scenario is you're given an elliptic curve defined over fp that's super singular, and you're given its entire endomorphism ring, so that's over the algebraic closure. Uh, and then we output an ideal that connects uh, that curve to some fixed starting curve uh, in polynomial time. There's one caveat here, namely turning this into an actual isogeny still take sub-exponential time um, because, well, the output, uh, this ideal that is output here is not particularly nice. And as I mentioned earlier, when describing seaside, uh, evaluating a general ideal on a curve takes uh, super polynomial time. Um, however, we also resolve the obvious question that comes from this, namely, can you do better? Can you maybe do this in polynomial time and output a smooth ideal? Uh, but we proved that this would imply that you can compute discrete logarithms in the class group of this imaginary quadratic field. And, I mean, fundamentally, there's no reason why this shouldn't be possible, but uh, it seems quite unlikely that this is just easy to do because people have thought about this problem. All right, that's the end of the presentation. Um, thanks for making it this far and enjoy the rest of the virtual conference.